right so in this class we are going to discuss the gauss's law and uh, we are going to discuss the basically uh, the gauss's law related to the electric field first and then we are going to discuss the gauss's law related to the magnetic field right so uh, so we have covered the coulomb's law principles and after that we are going to uh, discuss the ampere's law faraday's law and uh, i mean we are going to uh, discuss about lenz's law along with the faraday's law uh, and then uh, we are going to discuss about the maxwell's equations right uh, so maxwell uh, was the uh, scientist who was able to you know uh, solve the uh solve the uh, i mean mystery between electric field and mag magnetic fields so uh, he was able to combine uh, the electric field and magnetic fields um, uh, behavior and uh, uh, like explain uh, in a mathematical sense how uh, the electric and magnetic fields uh, behave uh, in the presence of each other so how the uh, electromagnetic waves are getting generated uh, what are the necessary uh, you know like uh, sources to create it and how uh, the electromagnetic waves propagate without a source so without an independent source uh, how the uh, electromagnetic waves keep keep uh, you know moving forward uh moving forward without even having a source uh, to uh, supply uh, some uh, sort of energy so uh, th uh, that uh, mystery was solved uh, by the uh, theories that were presented by uh, james maxwell so uh, the first uh, law that is important i mean the second law that is important i mean important for us to understand the electromagnetic waves and understand the maxwell's law is uh, the gaussian law so the gaussian law is defined as the electric flux passing through an any uh, closed surface uh, is equal to the total charge enclosed by that surface so what it means is that if you have certain volume like this that is given in this figure and there are some charges inside this volume uh, the charges uh, are combined and the total charge the total net charge is given by the value q and the the total flux that is generated due to this charge uh, is uh, uh, denoted by uh, the total uh, charge enclosed in this volume right so we can mathematically uh, mathematically uh, give that as an equation so there are two basic equation equations that we can uh, uh, give that as uh, so there are two forms we have integral form and we have the differential form right so uh, integral form uh, is basically uh, used for scenarios where we want to uh, calculate the total uh, electric flux all, all over the surface all over the surface uh, so uh, differential form of equation is used to uh, uh, identify and uh, understand the electric field at a certain point in the surface right per unit uh, area so so the differential form is uh, defined for uh, a unit area the integral form is defined for the total surface area so uh, we will uh, mathematically uh, understand the equations afterwards so the total flux that is um, going out moving out from the closed surface due to the charges that are enclosed in the surface is given by this uh, equation where flux is equal to the electric field uh, dot product with the area vector right so the area vector denotes the uh, the vector which we can form all over the surface of the closed volume right and uh, we are uh, we are considering that we are uh, taking the dot product of that vector with the electric field at each point of the surface 
Okay, so so uh, so uh, using the Gauss's law, we can find uh, the total uh, the total flux that is generated uh, uh, around a certain uh, closed surface by taking a look at the total charge enclosed in that closed surface, right? So, uh, so in this example, there are three closed surfaces. Uh, the first closed surface is known as A1. The second closed surface is known as A2. And the third one is known as A3. So uh, the surface area uh, basically uh, is denoted using A1, A2, A3 of each uh, surface. So um, the amount of charges that are enclosed in the surface are given by O1, O2, and O3, right? So anyway, there are charges at these positions O1, O2, and O3. So according to Gauss's law, what is the total flux that is going out from A1, right? So according to Gauss's law, what is the total flux that is... Uh, uh, transmitting or transferring, uh, moving out from the closed surface A1, right? So what is the total flux going out from the closed surface A1? So in order to find that answer, uh, so what what is the uh, what is the thing that you need to do? Right, the total flux is equal to the total in, enclosed volume, in, enclosed charge, right? So the enclosed charge divided by the uh, medium's uh, permittivity uh, is uh, giving us the fl total flux that is going out from this closed surface, okay? So this is basically the um, Gauss's law, right? So Gauss's law says that the total flux that is going out from a certain closed surface is equal to the uh, total charge which is enclosed in that closed volume, right? So the total flux can be taken by taking the sum of all the electric field lines that are generated due to the enclosed charge. Uh, if the enclosed charge is Q, then the total flux that is generated is Q over epsilon naught. So epsilon naught is taken assuming that the closed surface is in the free space, right? So, right? So the, uh, the, what is the total flux that is coming out of object A1? Can you let me know? I don't have much time. Please give me an answer. What is the total charge inside of volume A1? There are three charges inside this volume. What, what is the total charge? What is the total flux that is going out from this volume? Right, so you need to take the total sum of all the charges inside this volume and then you need to divide by the epsilon naught, right? So assuming that you know the value of epsilon naught, you can further find the value of uh, the uh, amount of flux that is created in this, uh, uh, around this uh, A1 closed volume, right? So phi is a, a scalar value. 
so therefore we do not have any units for the phi so therefore we just leave it like that so similarly you can find the amount of flux that is coming out from uh, a2 and a3 so as you can see directly we can say that a3 does not have any flux coming out because its uh, total uh, charge that is inside this volume is zero right and then we uh, see that the uh, total charge which is inside a2 is also zero but therefore uh, the amount of flux that is coming out from a2 is also zero so uh, basically uh, other charges you will say there are other charges inside the around these closed surfaces and whether they affect the electric flux inside these uh, a2 and a3 however like uh, the flux that is generated by these kind of charges will be uh, going coming inside the volume of a2 for example and going out of that volume at another location so therefore the total flux that is coming in is equal to the total flux that is going out and therefore uh, those uh, coming in and coming out will be cancelled out and therefore uh, the total net flux that is coming out from that volume will be zero Right. So in the last class, we discussed regarding the definitions of electric flux density. So we will go through that again. So electric flux density is the strength of the electric field per unit area. So it is measured per unit area. So the amount of flux that is uh, traveling out from a certain surface through a certain surface per unit area of its surface, um, out of its uh, surface area is known as the electric flux density. So it is a, a density or a measurement of density of electric flux lines. And therefore, uh, uh, the uh, electric, I mean, flux that is uh, measured per unit area has a certain direction because we are only considering a certain unit area. And in that unit area, once we take the electric flux that is going out, it has a certain direction. And therefore, the amount of electric flux that is or the direction of electric flux that is going through a through a unit area has a certain direction. Therefore, uh, we call that uh, we call that uh, parameter electric flux density a vector. Uh, also, the electric flux density is defined using this uh, letter D in, uh, in normally in the books. So we uh, denote using D uh, the electric flux density. So electric flux density is also mathematically uh, defined as the product between epsilon naught and electric field E. So uh, from there also we can see that electric field intensity is a vector. So therefore, uh, this uh, electric flux density also must be a vector. Uh, epsilon naught is a constant. So therefore, we can say that the uh, electric flux density also should be a vector. Uh, the units of electric flux density is coulombs per meter squared. So those are the basic things regarding electric flux density. Electric flux is a scalar. Electric flux density is a vector. So we will move fast for the sections on the sections we have covered already. So this is the section I think we decided to end in the last class. So we just started to discuss about the Gaussian law. So the Gaussian law can be mathematically defined or uh, represented or written using these two equations. So the differential form can be uh, uh, written using this equation uh, where this uh, a dot product between this uh, the grad function and also the uh, electric field function will be uh, uh, will be denoting the amount of electric flux that is moving out from a certain a unit volume in the uh, closed surface right so uh, the rho is defining the charge available per unit volume so the rho is defining the charge per unit volume. Uh, then epsilon naught is defining the permittivity uh, in the free space. So the dot product is giving us the divergence of the electric field. How much of uh, electric field uh, lines or electric field strength is going outward from a certain closed surface. So uh, that is 
the mathematical representation of the uh, Gaussian law for electric field. So this differential form is used in scenarios where we are analyzing or studying a unit volume or a unit area of the space and how, how uh, uh, th this is used to uh, study the amount of electric flux that is moving through a certain unit space, unit volume or unit area, something unit. Per unit, we are measuring this uh, electric flux, uh, uh, electric flux value. Uh, in the integral form, however, we are, we are measuring the total electric flux that is coming out from a closed surface, right? So earlier we uh, we decided the total, I mean, the electric flux that is coming through only a certain unit area or certain unit volume. Right? However, now in here, we are in the integral form, we are uh, calculating or we are taking the sum of the total electric flux that is moving out through a certain surface with a certain enclosed charge Q in enclosed and with a certain uh, and uh, which is uh, with, uh, where the surface is available in a certain medium uh, of permittivity epsilon naught. So we can write that equation using a closed surface integral, closed uh, area integral uh, like this, which uh, gives us uh, the value q enclosed over epsilon naught. So this integral is, this integral denotes that we are taking the integral over the closed surface, right? So this closed loop in this integral is uh, telling us that we are taking an integration over the closed surface, right? So we need to keep that in mind. So over the clo total closed surface, we are taking the integration. In, in the first equation, actually, we only took the, uh, the, the amount of electric flux per unit volume. So per unit volume, uh, the amount of electric flux that is coming out through that, right? So that value we found using this differential form. So, uh, so the electric flux that is generated due to the uh, charges that are available per unit volume, uh, this value is determined. So if you have any questions, you can ask. Right, so uh, I mean, explaining further, all the parameters are explained using uh, these, I mean, uh, using these labels. So the integration, uh, the integral form of the Gaussian law for the electric field, uh, is uh, co consisting of a closed surface, I mean, integral. And then electric field is denoted by E vector, vector E. And then the area vector is defined using this DA. So the area vector uh, is the vector which is perpendicular to the surface at each point that we are considering. So if we take a certain closed surface, and if we take that the electric field, uh, vector is at that point is E vector and the the unit area uh, in that position is uh, DA if the value of the area in that area in that surface unit area is DA then the vector unit vector along the perpendicular direction to that surface is not known as the DA vector. Okay, so the vector which is perpendicular to this area is known as the DA vector and this vector is perpendicular to the surface area. So therefore, uh, we are taking the dot product between the electric field through that surface and also the, uh, the perpendicular vector to that surface area. So once we are taking the cross or the dot product, we are, once we are taking the dot product between these two vectors, we are left off with the... Uh, uh, the projection of the electric field along the perpendicular direction to the surface area. So once we are taking the, I mean, uh, projection along the perpendicular area, we are able to find the perpendicular vector of the electric field uh, 
on this uh, area. So once we uh, find the perpendicular uh, component of the electric field on this area, we are able to find the total, I mean, electric field intensity at this point on the surface, right? So that is why we are taking the dot product and we are, that is why we are focusing on finding the perpendicular component of the electric field that is moving out through this surface uh, unit, I mean, area, right? So uh, by using this equation, you can find the uh, total uh, electric flux that is going out through a certain closed surface. And also we are able uh, using this uh, equation to find the electric field the intensity at a certain point on the, on the space, in the space. Right, so the advantages of uh, the Gaussian law for the electric field is that we can understand the symmetry of the charge distribution inside the closed surface. So what do I mean by that? So if we have different types of, uh, you know, charges inside this closed surface, we might have minus charges, we might have positive charges. So if we have a like a positive, uh, I mean, if the net net charge value is a positive charge, then the electric flux will be uh, a positive value. If the uh, net net uh, charge is a negative uh, value, then the, uh, the total flux going outward will be zero. And uh, likewise, we can understand uh, the charge distribution inside a certain uh, closed uh, surface using this Gaussian law. Uh, apart from that, using this Gaussian law, we can find the amount find the value of electric field at a certain point on the surface area. So uh, by uh, uh, by finding the amount of uh, electric, uh, electric uh, flux that is going out through a certain unit area, we can find uh, the uh, amount of uh, electric, uh, electric uh, field, uh, field uh, electric flux density per unit area. And also from that, we can find the electric field intensity uh, at that point in the space. So uh, we have many math mathematical equations that we can use to find the electric field intensity at that certain point of the uh, space uh, using this Gaussian law. Right, so I have discussed some questions or some examples in the class. So, so in uh, in this example, I'm asking uh, a question uh, regarding uh, the electric field that is generated by a positive charge Q at a certain distance R. So, in this question, what uh, I'm asking is. Uh, like find out the total electric field or the amount of electric field at a certain uh, distance r from a, a charge q uh, that is placed in a certain point in the space, right? So earlier I, I told you that we can use Gaussian law to find the uh, electric field at a certain point in the space, right? So once we take a closed surface of spherical nature, and once we have a certain amount of charges placed uh, of value Q inside the closed uh, closed volume, uh, then uh, we say that the amount of uh, electric flux that is generated in this space is uh, Is constant okay so so one now in here we have we have some so some collection of charges inside a certain volume of a sphere of a certain sphere and then uh, the sphere is uniform right it's a uniform sphere which is which is constructed at a certain radius r all all around this source charge q so uh, since this uh, electric field that is generated at each point 
of this surface is uh, generated due to the source charges. Um, we are going to now uh, we are going to now use the Gaussian law to find the uh, electric field at uh, at each point in the surface area. So uh, to do that, we are going to apply the uh, the integral form of the Gaussian law. So uh, once we are using the integral form, we can write that we can uh, multiply the E uh, electric field vector with the uh, the area uh, vector, right? Right, with the area vector, right? And then we can also write cos phi to show that we are taking the general uh, dot product between electric field and the uh, area vector. Right. So in this case, since we are uh, having a source charge right in the middle of the circle, the uh, amount of electric field uh, that is occurring in the, at the surface of the spherical uh, 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 sphere is uh, is perpendicular to the surface of the uh, surface of the uh, sphere. The electric field that is generated is perpendicular to the sphere surface because uh, the enclosed charge is right in the middle of the, uh, you know, uh, this sphere, and therefore uh, the amount of, uh, I mean, uh, electric field that is uh, getting generated is going to pass through this surface in the perpendicular manner. So, uh, because of this, the vectors E and the vectors dA are parallel to each other. And because of that, the amount of uh, angle phi is going to be zero. Because of that, we, we can say that the amount of electric field and the, magne uh, and the uh, area vector product is only going to remain here. And the cost, cost zero value, cost zero is going to be one, right? Cost zero, cost zero is one. Therefore, only the effect of E and dA is remaining. Apart from that, since the due to the symmetry of the spherical object, the amount of electric field that is generated at each point uh, on this surface is equal in magnitude. So, uh, because the distance from the source to that surface points is equal at each point on this surface, because of that, the uh, total. Uh, the total, uh, I mean, sorry, the electric field uh, that is generated at each point on this pier is equal and constant at the, any point of the surface. Because of that, we can uh, take the value of E out of this integral. We can keep the uh, area vector inside the integral and we are left alone with this equation. Once we have this, we can uh, we can separate out the electric field parameter and we can take the value for the electric field uh, by taking the integration of the uh, by taking the integration of the uh, uh, area uh, using this integral right so we know the area of the uh, sphere is given by uh, 4 phi r, r squared right 4 phi r squared so by using this equation you can find the value of uh, you can separate out the uh, value of e so once we do that we are left alone with this equation where e is equal to 1 over 4 pi f0 naught q over r squared right so uh, by using gauss's law we can find the magnitude of electric field at any point on the uh, in the space so we just need to create a closed surface that will uh, that will uh, go through that point that we are considering, right? So let's say we want to find the electric field at a certain point in the space. We need to create the that uh, surface, that closed surface that goes through this point. So we need to create this point. We need to create this surface that goes through this point, right? So then we can evaluate that surface using the Gaussian law, right? So we need to know the amount of total charges enclosed in that volume and then we also need to create the volume the vo volume surface appropriately right by doing all that we can define the magnitude of electric field that is uh, generated on top of the surface points and the uh, considered uh, volume 
and uh, also we can define the direction of the electric field. So the electric field is generated away from and along the line connecting the observer and the source. So the source is here. The observing point is here, right? So the electric field is generated along this line, right? Along this line that connects both the charge, source charge and the observing uh, test charge right so uh, because of this since the line is going to be perpendicular to the surface we know that the electric field that is generated is perpendicular to the surface of the sphere so electric field will be in the perpendicular direction to the surface of the sphere right if you have any questions you can ask so we have discussed about the gaussian law for the electric field with that uh, with that content, right? After that, we have to discuss about the a magnetic field, a magnetomotive force, and uh, we need to discuss about the Gaussian law for the magnetic field, right? So I will try to uh, try to uh, cover up those sessions sections as well. Right, so let's uh, continue with the magnetic field. So uh, with this uh, magnetic field, we, uh, we are going to discuss about the Gaussian law for the magnetic field. So in order to discuss the Gaussian law, we need to first identify the concepts behind magnetic field, uh, how they are generated, and uh, what are the parameters that define a magnetic field and so on. After that, we will discuss about the Gaussian law for the magnetic field. And with that, we will, we will be able to finish the Gaussian law. Gaussian law, and then we will move towards Ampere's law and Faraday's law. Right, so the magnetic fields, magnetic fields are regions where we experience a certain magnetic force, right? So, uh, if we take a certain bar magnet and we keep it in a space where we have filled with metallic uh, fillings, then we are able to uh, see the uh, uh, formation of uh, like circles around the bar magnet. So once we see these lines, we can see that there's some force acting on these metal uh, fillings by the bar magnet. So, uh, so there are many, you know, naturally available, uh, you know, magnets in the world. However, like the uh, the permanent magnets are limited in the world. So therefore, uh, we cannot use these permanent magnets for all applications uh, because the resources are limited. So only in uh, some uh, materials, we are able to observe the magnetic field formation around that um, around that material. So materials such as iron, cobalt, nickel are said to have good magnetic fields. Apart from that, a good uh, like uh, good invention by the humans is uh, the formation of magnetic fields due to electric currents. And so once we are changing the uh, the magnitude of the electric currents, then we are able to generate magnetic fields around the electric current. So we are able to generate magnetic field using the rate of change of uh, current across a certain conductor, right? So if we take a certain, uh, you know, metal conductor and we uh, move uh, the current through this certain conductor uh, by using some, uh, I mean, variable voltage input, 
right we are varying the voltage input uh, by using that variable uh, voltage input then we can alternating alternating uh, voltage we are able to uh, uh, we are able to provide uh, an alternating voltage which creates an alternating current and this current will move downwards and it will move upwards right so uh, once this uh, current is uh, varying with the time uh, that varying current will produce a, a magnetic field okay so the varying current will pro produce a magnetic field so the magnetic field will be uh, generated around the uh, the conductor and the direction of the magnetic field is given using the uh, right hand rule right hand rule so direction of the magnetic field is given using the right hand rule right so we can use the right hand rule to determine the direction of the magnetic field right so uh, if you can see the first figure shows the current is going upwards and therefore if we use our right hand and we move our or we keep our thumb in the direction of the current then uh, the direction of our fingers the, the direction of our fingers indicate the direction of the magnetic field and then if we keep the thumb in the downward direction and we try to move our fingers in the uh, clockwise direction then we see that the magnetic field is moving in the uh, clockwise direction right so i hope it is uh, somewhat clear to you so we can use the right hand rule to determine to find out the direction of the magnetic field Apart from that, another important thing is the magnetic field or magnet cannot live with only one pole. There's no monopoles under magnets, right? So always north and south poles stay together, right? So therefore, once we are having uh, like magnets, we always have north pole and south pole, right? There's no incidence where we see north pole is uh, you know, staying separately and the South Pole is staying uh, separately, individually. So there are no magnetic monopoles as of now. Uh, so if, we, if they are discovered in the future, then the laws that we have derived so far will not uh, really, you know, be valid. In that case, we have to uh, update the equations. However, for the moment, up to the findings so far, we have found that it is uh, not possible to have one uh, pole, uh, either North Pole or South Pole, staying in an individual manner. So they don't stay in individual manner. They're not staying in individual manner, but they will stay uh, as a group, like North Pole and South Pole, they will be as a group. So uh, we have uh, always North Pole and South Pole uh, once we consider a magnet. And then, uh, what happens if we bring a certain magnet with the North Pole and South Pole to near to a, another magnet which has poles North and South? So if we bring these two uh, magnets, what will happen? Will, will they attract or will they repel as you think? Right. In the first case, since the uh, poles are opposite, the poles are opposite. Since the poles are opposite, right? The close by poles, the close by poles are South Pole and North Pole. And since the poles are opposite, they will attract. And in the case where we have uh, North Pole and North Pole near or close by, then they will uh, repel. Right. Another important thing is that the elect or the magnetic field lines that are generated around the uh, you know magnet can be denoted uh, using a diagram. I will draw it. Right. So I will draw it here. So what is the magnetic field that is generated around a bar magnet right so if we take a bar magnet 
we have a north pole and south pole and uh, the magnetic field lines will be starting from the north pole and ending at, in the south pole so uh, this phenomena will happen symmetrically around this axis so if we have three lines on one side then uh, same you know same uh, same lines say very similar lines will be created on the other side of the axis of the uh, bar magnet and uh, so i'm um, uh, these lines should be symmetrical around the axis of the bar magnet right so the magnetic field lines will extend from the north to the south right so inside the bar magnet what is the direction of the magnetic fields what is the direction of the magnetic field inside the bar magnet Right. So there's a one principle that you need to remember that is the magnetic field lines are continuous, right? Magnetic field lines are continuous. So that means there's no, uh, you know, there's no break, break point. There's no place where the magnetic field lines are breaking at one point. So therefore, there's no break uh, for these lines. So the the lines will start from north and will end at north so therefore the magnetic field lines inside the magnet will move or will will be have will be generated from the south to the north right so whatever the field lines that were generated from the north pole will come back to the north pole even through the magnet even inside the magnet uh, the magnetic field lines will act and the magnetic field lines will uh, will uh, will be uh, moving or will be generated uh, from the south pole uh, will be uh, moving from the south pole to the north pole right so the magnetic field lines will still exist inside the bar magnet apart from that this diagram uh, tells you like main parameters that uh, magnetic field lines are uh, denoted and uh, magnetic field lines can be uh, represented. So there are main parameters that we can use. So these these field lines show us the direction of the magnetic field, right? So the magnetic field is denoted using these uh, lines, right? So the direction of these lines show us the direction of the magnetic field. And then uh, the amount of magnetic field strength is uh, can be uh, uh, characterized 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 by the uh, amount of uh, magnetic field lines per unit uh, unit space. So we will uh, we will discuss about the magnetic field uh, magnetic field related parameters such as magnetic flux and magnetic flux density, right? So, right, so the amount of magnetic flux density is uh, defined as the amount of uh, magnetic flux lines that are going through a certain space uh, area. Okay, so if you take a certain unit area unit surface area or unit space area then the amount of uh, magnetic flux lines that are going through this surface area denotes the uh, the magnetic flux density so magnetic flux density is the amount of magnetic flux that is going through a certain unit area so we need to take a certain unit area so 
uh, if we take a certain unit area, the amount of flux going through that area is known as the magnetic flux density. The amount of, I mean, how dense the magnetic field lines are through a certain unit area. That is what we are uh, meaning by electric flux density. Right. Then uh, we are going to actually discuss about the magnetic, uh, magnetic. Uh, uh, I mean, we are going to discuss about the Ampere's law. So before that, uh, we discussed about the uh, magnetic flux and magnetic flux density. So magnetic flux are given by the field lines that we drew around the bar magnet, right? So around the bar magnet, we drew, drew these lines, right? So these are the, uh, you know, magnetic uh, flux lines, right? So these are the magnetic flux lines. So these lines are magnetic flux lines. Right, so that is denoted. These lines denote the magnetic flux. The amount of magnetic flux that are going through a certain unit area. If this is a unit area, let's. If this is a unit area, the amount of field lines or flux lines that are going through this unit area denote the magnetic flux density. And then mag magnetic field. So the magnetic field is the amount of force magnetic force that we uh, experience at a certain point in the space right so magnetic force we can uh, we can uh, define using a certain equation right so uh, that equation i think we are going to learn in the next uh, section where we discuss about the ampere's law right so uh, Right. So, uh, so uh, we can actually, I mean, uh, I think with this actually, this uh, content I have finished. I mean, uh, we have, I have, uh, I have. Uh, That is the end of the slide of that presentation. So I need to uh, discuss with you the magnetic force, right? So the magnetic force, and uh, after that, the magnetic uh, magnetomotive force, I need to discuss with you, right? So I will, I will check. So the magnetic force and the magnetomotive force are two things, okay? So you need to keep that in your mind, okay? So uh, magnetic force, we can denote using a certain equation and uh, we, we, uh, we can define the direction of the magnetic force using that equation. Right? So we were learning about the magnetic field, right? Magnetic field, magnet magnetic flux, magnetic flux, magnetic flux density. And then uh, mag magnetic force. Right? So uh, something I want to mention about the magnetic flux density. I think I was not able to explain earlier. So magnetic flux density. 
I have uh, discussed and I have explained to you is the amount of flux, magnetic flux going through a certain unit area. So this we can denote using uh, the mathematical equation B equals mu naught H, right? Assuming that the uh, electric or the magnetic field is available in the free space. So B equals mu naught H. So in here, uh, the B value of B denote the flux density, magnetic flux density, okay? So uh, the magnetic flux, we can also denote it using another symbol, uh, the capital of phi and then uh, magnetic field we normally denote using cap capital H right and then mag uh, the magnetic force is defined uh, using this equation QVB sine theta right so uh, this equation uh, is uh, uh, is coming uh, by uh, the fact that by by uh, by the uh, fact that the uh, the the cross product between the uh, the charge velocity and the magnetic field produces this force. Right. So I will explain a certain scenario to explain this idea. So the force, right? The force that acts on a certain charge electric charge which is moving at a certain velocity uh, let's say there's an electric charge here with q uh, q of uh, amount of electric charge right there's a certain charge with value q and then we'll assume it's moving at a certain velocity v right and then we'll assume that there's a certain magnitude of uh, magnetic field along the other um, perpendicular direction which is let's say this is the y axis this is the x axis this is the z axis if that is the case now we can find the um, force acting on this electric charge due to the presence of the magnetic field and the uh, due to the velocity of this charge, right? So the force that is acting on this charge is given using this equation, QVB sine theta. So in here, the value of Q is the amount of electric charge, right? And the value of V is the uh, velocity of the charge. And then the, I mean, uh, B is the amount of uh, the flux density, right? So magnetic flux density, right? So that value we can find using mu naught h, right? So mu naught h. So we need to uh, multiply the magnetic field value uh, by the mu naught parameter. So uh, once we know all these, we can find the force acting on this Q charge. But from that, this same equation can also be written in a separate, in a different manner. Uh, by indicating the direction of the force as well, right? So that is more important, I think. So therefore, I mean, since we know that this force is having a certain direction, we can denote this direction using n hat, right? And that direction will depend on the uh, this operation, right? Uh, the, that direction will depend on the operation of uh, cross product between the velocity and the magnetic field. So the cross product of the velocity and the magnetic field will give the direction of the uh, force acting on this uh, on this charge, right? So once we take the cross product, we know that we we need to move our right hand from the velocity vector up to the uh, you know the electric or the magnetic field vector. So by uh, moving our fingers from V to B, we can see that the force is going to act vertically upwards on this charge right so uh, with that we know that n hat is vertically upwards right n hat is vertically upwards right so with that we can define the force on a certain um, a certain electric charge under the uh, magnetic field right so uh, so that is regarding the magnetic force, right? So after that, we can discuss about the Ampere's law, 
now we have discussed about the uh, magnetic field magnetic flux density magnetic flux and magnetic force right so uh, next what we need to go through is the ampere's law right so ampere's law says that a certain uh, electromotive force uh, certain electromotive force sorry ampere's law says that uh, certain uh, uh, certain magnetomotive force magnetomotive force is generated under the presence of a varying electric field right so right so i will try to show you the a diagram Right, uh, so Ampere's law says that once you are changing uh, the rate of change of electric field, then a certain magnetic force is created around that. So therefore, we can see here that once we are changing the current uh, up and down, once we are varying the current, uh, and we make the current move up and move down. Then once we alternate the current, then the magnetic field, a magnetic field is generated around this uh, conductor. So once we our, our current is going in a certain direction, it is going downwards, then the, uh, the magnetic field that is created will be in a certain direction. And that direction is found using the right hand rule so if we move our, if we keep our uh, finger along the current direction then we can find the magnetic fields formation so if we keep our thumb along the current direction then our fingers will point in the direction of the magnetic field so uh, the amount of magnetic uh, magneto uh, magnetic field or magnetomotive force that is created is given using this Ampere's law. So the mathematical equation will give us the amount of magnetomotive force or magnetomotive potential that is generated around this conductor, right? So um, if we take, for example, electric field potential, in electric field potential, we can clearly see a certain voltage getting, uh, you know, uh, produced in a certain, uh, in the certain uh, metal loop or surface. But uh, in this case, magnetomotive force formation means that uh, we can see formation of magne magnetic field curls or the, uh, I mean, uh, magneto magnetic fields, formation of magnetic fields around the, uh, around the varying electric field or varying current. We can see curls of, curls of loops of magnetic field created around this conducting wire, right? So uh, that is basically the uh, concept behind the Ampere's law. The Ampere's law can be mathematically uh, described using some equations. So in there also we have integral form, differential form, and uh, likewise we can evaluate the Ampere's law, right? So uh, anyway, right? So after Ampere's law, we need we we will be discussing about the Faraday's law. The Faraday's law says something similar to Ampere's law, but in in that law, we are uh, we are introducing uh, the uh, the fact that once we are changing the magnetic field, we can create an electric uh, electro electro uh, electromotive electro electromotive force, which is equivalent to electric potential. So, once we are changing magnetic field, we can generate electromotive force and a certain electric field around the uh, magnetic field. So by that concept and the Ampere's law concept, we can, uh, we can uh, prove that a certain uh, electromagnetomot electromagnetic wave can be generated by using a varying current. So by using varying current, we can generate magnetic field. By the change in the magnetic field, we can create an electric field. And then uh, likewise, from the change in the electric field, we can generate a magnetic field. And likewise, this 
procedure will uh, continue as a chain of activities and then it will be able to create a propagating electromagnetic wave. Right. So the mathematics behind Ampere's law I will discuss in the next class. Uh, so with that point, I will end today's class. If you have any questions you can ask.